great, let's 3D print it, let's send it off, let's get something. We started yesterday, we're going to have something to you by tomorrow. We're seeing a lot of that passion translating into efforts to help. Open source is going to get us out of this crisis. They're sewing face masks, 3D printing ventilator valves, converting snorkeling gear into respirators, and crowdsourcing research into diagnosis and treatment. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, all across the world, people who are locked in their homes are still organizing in novel ways that may have a lasting impact on culture and society well after this crisis fades. Communities can come together over this, this knowledge sharing. Nathan Young organized the Coronavirus Tech Handbook, which started out as a one-page shared Google Doc a month ago and has grown into one of the largest and most widely used online libraries of tools in the fight against the virus. We had just one single page and now it's 50 different sections. The Handbook is an internationally crowdsourced compilation of tips, guidelines and resources that's edited by a 10-person team of volunteers based in the UK thousands of projects, it's got thousands of people in the community. In communities around the globe, people are pooling resources and providing assistance to neighbors in need, a throwback to the mutual aid societies that acted as a social safety net before the rise of the welfare state. Just get in contact if you need some food delivering, if you need, you know, if you need any help of any kind. As the severe shortage of personal protective equipment became apparent, home sewing networks sprung into action to make improvised face masks. It's kind of community in sewing. Sewing people are good people. Jan Brostick has been selling sewing machines in the Cleveland area since she was 16 years old. Now she and her son Connor run the Pins and Needles sewing supply shops in town. One of our local hospitals reached out to us. First they needed 10,000, and the day later they needed 100,000. So we developed the pattern by their specifications. I have about 100 grandmas here locally at Pins and Needles, and my goal is to have about a million grandmas on the internet. After they made a tutorial video for their homemade mask, hundreds of thousands of people began using the plans and convening to share tips and improvements on their Facebook page. Donating all their fabric and cutting them on. You can see this one's got Cleveland Browns on one side and Cleveland Indians on the other. The pair says they're on track to surpass their goal of making one million masks for medical workers. We actually brought in a chair yoga specialist to do videos because everyone was tired because they're making so many masks. In just days, a solution to the problem facing medical professionals around the country. Schools, businesses, and hobbyists have also turned their 3D printers into micro factories for medical equipment. We're seeing a massive willingness in the maker community to get involved before larger manufacturers can catch up to manufacturing these at scale. Printing the tooling, this is a very useful application of 3D printing. 3D printing and additive manufacturing also allow for the quick prototyping and production of parts that can convert equipment that is not in short supply into life-saving medical devices. Converting a snorkeling mask, I believe, into a sort of respirator device. We're seeing application of 3D printing there and the production of nasal swabs and tests. Other DIYers are developing diagnostic tools that require no physical testing kits, such as by analyzing voice samples that people record on their phones. Remote testing can actually potentially reach every person on Earth. Dr. Rita Singh is a researcher at Carnegie Mellon University who has worked on applying AI to the field of voice forensics since 2014. Now there are some diseases that are so clear, we are more than 95% sure that we, we might be able to detect. Now she co-leads a team of 10 students at the School of Computer Science on the Corona Voice Detect project, which uses a machine learning system to analyze a short sample of someone's voice and determine their likelihood of having the coronavirus on a scale of 1 to 10. Singh says their system isn't meant to replace traditional testing because it can't give a definitive diagnosis, but it could act as a first-line screening. Take the, a little bit of load off of the hospital testing system. I tested positive for COVID-19. That has come out. Positive. It came back positive. Yeah, and it sucks. They've started by feeding the system public statements from COVID positive celebrities and YouTube posters, but they must crowdsource more data before it becomes accurate enough for diagnostic use. We are soliciting data through our website. What we are putting together is a self learning system, and the system will get more and more confident as it goes forward. That's uh, you know, a very powerful thing that you're only able to do because of open source and the way that technology works today. Bruce Fenton began publicly warning about the threat of the coronavirus in February and started several open source initiatives. You have a lot of volunteers, some very high level people, whether it's doctors, scientists, investors. The first day I announced one project and there was 80 volunteers within a day and then there's people running off and doing their own thing. Even in this dark times, it is a nice light to say, wow, there's a lot of 
quality people out there. A team out of MIT recently released specs for a $100 mechanical ventilator, and technologists around the world are building on each other's open source data and plans. It's particularly scalable and fast, and you have hundreds or thousands of people working on these issues, and people donating and everything. That's, that's very, very valuable. And it's very hard for a centralized organization to duplicate. Fenton is also involved in Foldit, an online game portal that essentially creates a distributed supercomputer. Players use their personal computing power to solve puzzles related to the structure of viral proteins. And then the University of Washington is going to take the most successful designs and actually produce that as a drug. So Fold.it, by playing the game, you're actually helping out with university research on the coronavirus. I have the ultimate authority, the President of the United States, calls the shots. A possible downside to decentralization is that there's no formal oversight. You don't want anybody in a shed knocking up a medical device. So here we have a simple gate valve from the hardware store. But some makers say consumer protection is possible without relying on a central authority. People can add to our document literally by typing in the URL. There's no accounts, there's just nothing. And I think a lot of people, they get scared initially about the idea that, you know, won't somebody ruin it? You end up with tools which are more easily error checked. People go through the code, they improve things. You end up with tools which are better for privacy often because, you know, you've not got some company behind it which is trying to take your data. The doctors in particular, you know, they'll ask each other, oh, does anybody have this? Does anybody have the guidelines for that? On this YouTube, I'd like to show you how to modify one ventilator to ventilate two or four patients simultaneously. With the help of this video, Gautier and his team retooled each ventilator to help save multiple lives. I think it would be great if so many of the epidemiology models we'd seen had been released to the public. There was nothing about this crisis which was unpredictable. It's based on a feasibility study that was published in 2006. You know, Bill Gates has been complaining about this for years. This was an entirely predictable crisis, which with a few billion pounds of investment could have been, you know, more or less entirely avoided. Fully self-organizing groups with social welfare programs have sprung up in a matter of weeks, and they're continuing to evolve in complexity. These communities so far are doing all of their structuring. They are deciding what's important. There's going to be systems for managing it, for keeping people's data safely. There's going to be systems for managing money. And so our mutual aid section is now about four systems. If technocrats and bureaucrats and politicians try and monkey with guessing how the world is going to work, it's never going to work. This idea that the Defense Production Act should be used, I ask, well, has the federal government proven themselves to be particularly competent so far? Are the words about a pandemic at this point? No, we're not at all, and uh, we're, we have it totally under control. The tests are beautiful. Anybody that needs a test gets a test, and the tests are all perfect. U.S. lawmakers have now proposed a vast biometric surveillance system that would persist well beyond the coronavirus pandemic. But Fenton says it's possible through decentralized technologies to realize the benefits of contact tracing while preserving user privacy. We need to have control of those things through private keys, and that would be a perfect fit for something like tracking, where everybody involved is voluntary and nobody can find out anybody's information without them sharing it. The 2020s may be off to a rough start, but efforts such as these show the potential for technology and human ingenuity to empower individuals in the coming decade, even when they're sitting on their couch. Just, you know, search if, if you want something that you want to be involved in. There are communities growing all the time. There's communities for volunteers, for teachers, for doctors. Even if you're just grabbing some food for your neighbor, I'm just very moved by the amount of work that everyone is doing just for everybody else. There is a really vibrant and optimistic uh, thing going on here. If we can keep pushing this, we can fix it approach because it turns out we can. Mm -hmm.